My name is Doug Gustafson, and um, it says here, it's nice that when you're in the class of 61, that's, you know, before most of you were born, um, they give you all the details to read. So, and it even says here that I am a uh, science master's, which is right, but with frequent flyer miles, I've been graduated to an MBA on my name tag, so at some point we went to an MBA. Uh, well, welcome to this morning's uh, uh, session with uh, Rastef Levy. Uh, there are a couple other announcements I want to make. Uh, there is still some space available for some of the afternoon workshops if you want to check the registration desk downstairs. Uh, this session is being recorded uh, and will be uh, shared on the school's website during the course of the summer. So when we get to the Q&A period, uh, we would like you to um, identify yourself and your class and uh, speak uh, into a mic so it will be well recorded. With that, I'll turn it over to uh, my old friend we met five minutes <laughs> ago, Rustin. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. I uh, appreciate uh, the courage. Uh, I understood, understood that you have a very interesting uh, evening going back to uh, uh, some, some sort of a cease faction uh, party. So I appreciate all of you that uh, woke up and uh, are here. Um, my name is Rustin Levy. Um, and what I would try to do in the next uh, hour and a half is to uh, give you some sense about uh, some activities that uh, take place it, it, within Sloan in the last uh, five years uh, around healthcare, um, activities that I'm uh, personally very excited about. And um, uh, th 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 there are two goals to, the, uh, to this uh, uh, um, lecture. Um, one is to give you uh, some interesting stories, but beyond that, to project some vi vision to the future uh, that I hope uh, will uh, inspire you as well. Um, and since it, the name is Back to the Classroom, I decided to, that instead of having it as a dry lecture, I will actually have it as a class. So uh, wake up, you're going to be <laughs> asked questions. So, uh, um, okay, so let me just uh, introduce myself uh, very briefly, uh, as the accent probably reveals. Uh, I'm, I'm coming from Israel. Um, I had a relatively long career of over, o over 11 years in the Israeli military as an intelligence officer. Uh, I did my bachelor degree in uh, Tel Aviv University in mathematics uh, in, with a trend uh, uh, in operations research. Um, did, I came to the U.S. to do my Ph.D. In two and, and finished in 2005 f from Cornell University, then uh, spent one year at uh, IBM as a, a postdoc. Uh, and then joined the, in 2006, uh, joined the uh, faculty of the Sloan School. Um, these are my uh, research uh, interests. Um, uh, it's basically a combination of uh, more uh, fundamental and theoretical work with a lot of applied work. Uh, and one of the industries that I'm uh, particularly active in is the healthcare industry, and that's going to be uh, the focus of the talk today. So, so before I start and talk about what we did in healthcare, I think it's... Uh, um, some, some, somewhat uh, important to understand the context. Uh, so, um, so he, here is here is one first slide. Um, so what you see here, uh, this is basically uh, the evolution of the spending on healthcare in the U.S. as a, the percentage out of the GDP, the national GDP, uh, put on on healthcare, okay, over time. And um, any thoughts about this? Wow. <laughs> Why wow? 14%. How many trillion? It's actually 16%, 16 now. 16, 16 cents of every dollar produced in this country is going to healthcare. Uh, uh, well, we, we'll see about that. Uh, so, so it's going up. Uh, what do you say? Why the flat space between 1992 and 1990? Okay, so, so there is some plateau. Uh, this is basically when people try to implement uh, what is called cap cap capitated healthcare, where basically they really put stringent uh, limitation on how much you can spend. Uh, but that created other problems. Uh, My question is what you get out of it. Yeah, so, so actually, uh, absolutely. Th that's a great, so the question was what do you get out of this? And, and let me just uh, maybe take this even further. Who said that this is a bad thing, right? I mean, maybe it's a great thing, right? We are such a great country, we spend so much on healthcare. It's very important. We spend a lot of money on healthcare. Okay, so um, so so two, two things. So one thing that is very clear from here, this is really a national challenge. Uh, it's going up. 
uh, I can tell you that it's also a business opportunity. This is an industry that last year we spent $2.9 trillion on this industry. That's a lot of money. Uh, yes, question. Why, why is it a challenge? It's great. It adds $2.9 trillion to our GDP, and we want our GDP to grow. We keep on saying we want our GDP to grow. We don't want to be a recession. So, so that's great. Basically you, say, basically, you say maybe it's a great thing. We spend on healthcare. Okay. So, fair enough. Fair enough. We'll, we'll address. Yes. But it also reflects the fact that GDP is growing slower, much slower than the cost of health. Okay, so that, that's something that we should observe. Yes, GDP, if the relative percentage growth of healthcare grows, that means that healthcare spendings are growing far more than the GDP. Yes. Do you plan to overclock demographics, uh, life expectancy, uh, aging population? Okay, so, let, so let, let's just see. So the first thing that okay. I think uh, the lady back there said, okay, let's just see how we compare to other, uh, other countries, right? So uh, here's the comparison, the same, same uh, again, percentage out of GDP, uh, of other developed countries, U.S. is here, okay, here, uh, where the light blue is basically private and the dark uh, blue is, uh, is public uh, spending. Any thoughts about this? Wow, okay. What do you say? So public spending is very similar. Private spending is actually uh, much more uh, here, uh, but the total spending is by far uh, more than any other developed country. Um, so again, uh, back to this gentleman uh, who said that this is a bad thing, right? So, it's, so, so far we established it's very high, it's much higher than other countries. Uh, um, so, so one question is why is this the case? Uh, and the other question is, is this a bad thing? Yes? It's meeting the needs of the population. Okay, so, uh, uh, so basically people start to allude to the fact, okay, what do we get? I think that someone asked, what do we get for this? Okay, so let's just see. Um, um, here's another... Uh, what's, uh, what's uh, public and what's private? So, like, who pays? Uh, yes, so who is... So, yeah, if it's the government versus, uh, versus you and I or some other private companies that spend, spend money. So, okay, so this is, this is basically a number of MRI exams per capita. Okay, and again, uh, U.S. is here together with Greece, I don't know what Greek uh, people have with MRIs, but uh, I guess they like it. Uh, maybe, uh, is there any Greek person in the audience? Um, so, um, again, w what is the conclusion from this? Yeah, we do a lot of MRIs. So we consume a lot of resources. I mean, this play in this country, you consume a lot of resources of healthcare. Okay? But again, maybe it's a good thing, right? Um, you know, uh, Uh, well, yes, but more, th more than that, um, uh, what, what is the tension here, right? So we have a tension here between th three things, right? The, the cost, we already captured this, right? Uh, we spend a lot. Uh, and the, the other two uh, um, dimensions in the, uh, in the equation is our access and quality. Uh, so I need to define that, right? So cost is very... Easy, especially for people that graduate from business school, right? We, we, know, we know a lot about cost, revenue, so it's about money. Uh, what about access? Uh, access, patients' ability to receive appropriate care when needed, and quality is providing patients with safe and appropriate care. Any thoughts about this? Yes? Well, I think there's kind of a, maybe it's not missing, but uh, demand. Uh, okay. Do we have a higher incidence of the more expensive health needs, and are we also more willing to pay for it? Okay, so, so one thing is uh, uh, perhaps if I want to do a very serious uh, job, I need to really refine the analysis that uh, I just showed you. Uh, fair enough, fair comment. Yes? But, but I also remember learning somewhere else that the amount we spend in the last two months of life in the United States is greater than that of most other countries, so we just want to live extra long. Yeah, okay, so, so the, the, there is the issue of end of life spending, okay. Um, so, so let's just see a couple of facts, a couple of facts here. Uh, access. Uh, until very recently, it's still the case, more than 15% in, in this country are uninsured. That means that they don't have access to health care. Uh, this is something that the new health care bill supposedly is going to, aiming to solve, uh, with the one caveat uh, that it's it, it sort of very good on uh, stating aspirations, but uh, I think it's fair to say that nobody has a clue how you're going to go about implementing it and who's going to pay for that. Uh, so. Um, that's one problem. Here are some issues about quality in this country. Uh, 100, it's estimated that 100,000 people every year die in hospitals in the U.S. due to adverse 
errors, preventable adverse error. Okay? And it's also estimated that 30% of all the $2.9 trillion that we talked about, 30% is waste uh, due to overuse, underuse, or misuse of resources. Okay? Now, now, yes? Jonathan Stewart would say that that's not 15% uninsured, but self-insured. Um, well, <laughs> that's one way to look at it, right? <laughs> um, but I think it's fair to say that a lot of these 15% are, um, the self is kind of, it's weak, let me put it this way. Uh, yes? Uh, in, in, uh, at the, from a perspective on the 100,000 people, just that piece of that, the quality thing, how does that compare to other countries that have a better... Excellent. So how do we compare to other countries? So uh, it's just one... One indicator, infant mortality, okay? Uh, again, developed countries, the U.S. is here. Okay? We, are at the we, are, we are heading the curve on this. Uh, we, we have a lot of more babies dying here. Uh, and that's something that you will see if you look on other quality indicators. So the, the fact is that we, just sorry, the fact is uh, we pay much more, we spend much more on health care, uh, but the outcome that we get is, at the very least, not superior well, it's fair to say that in many dimensions, actually inferior to other countries. Yes? But is that corrected for the health of the mother? Right? Because we have a much higher rate of type 2 diabetes. We have a lot of older mothers giving birth. And both of those dramatically increase the rate of infant mortality far beyond what the statistics would indicate. Actually, from that, you're doing pretty well. So, so that, that's a fair comment. So, so actually, it's alluding to something even more fundamental when you talk about health care. Uh, how do you measure quality? Right? It's a very tricky. Very tricky thing in, in, in healthcare. Uh, I'm not going to discuss it in details now, but, but it's probably one of the most uh, uh, fundamental challenges in this industry. How do you, how do you appropriately define healthcare? Uh, I can tell you that almost any indicator that you will take, the U.S. is definitely not ahead of the curve compared to other developed countries that spend much less than the U.S. Okay? So uh, I just gave an example. We just have an hour and a half, so I, we cannot go into very many details in this. So fair, fair to say it's a tricky thing to measure, but at least the common, the, the common measures out there, the U.S. is not doing well uh, or not better than other countries. Right, we had a question. Yes? Have you sliced and diced anything uh, that determines how much of spending overall is direct patient care versus infrastructure costs? Uh, well, th there are analysis of this. Well, going back to this, you know, at least 30% is waste. That's the estimate. At least 30% 30, 30 of $2.9 trillion, how much is that? A lot of money, right? <laughs> okay. Without my, my algebra in the morning is uh, not so, is a bit shaky. So, yes? How much of that waste is recycled? Uh, well, good question. Yes? Is it true that only 1% of the U.S. Uh, health care budget goes into primary care visits between patients and primary care physicians? So, so I'm not sure about this uh, data, the data point, but, uh, but definitely primary care, uh, 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 primary care is, is a big issue in the, US, in the United States. Uh, there are not enough doctors. Uh, it's the lowest paid profession within the medical profession. It's the lowest paid, so people do not have incentives to go to this. And uh, if you go to the case where suddenly all of these 15% peop uh, people are now mandatory, will have to have insurance, uh, then you have to ask yourself, who's going to take care of them? Uh, because if you don't have a primary care physician, what do you do? You go to the ED, to the emergency department, right? And that's much more costly uh, and could be one reason why the costs are very high. Uh, yes, last question before we move on. Is there an index or some, some kind of metric on marketed health services versus provided health services in the sense that in this country, most of the, mar of the health services we get are heavily marketed to the end user, to the doctor at a great cost, as opposed to other countries that, okay. you know, that if it's delivered by the government, it's uh, not marketed. Uh, excellent question. Let me, let me hold this for a second, and I will get back to you in just a, just a bit. Really, last question before we go on. Yes. You already mentioned, I'm sorry, I came in late. Yeah. Prevention versus treatment of sickness. Uh, isn't a dollar more effectively spent in the prevention than in the treatment, but the profit motives? are such that uh, capitalism favors treating... A, 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 another, another excellent question, another excellent question. So let's just move on and, and I, will, I will get back to you on, on, on that one as well. So, uh, okay, so let's just think about what is the typical scenario of healthcare delivery in the U.S.? So, so what is the core, if you think about healthcare delivery, what is the core interaction? 
What is the core interaction? Who, in, who is involved in the core interaction? Just, if you, if you don't mind, uh, I always say to my students, don't mumble because nobody can hear you and we cannot have a discussion. So take ownership, the yes. Pays and the um, and the doctor delivers and the, and the person receiving treatment doesn't actually understand the real cost. Okay, so you already ahead of me. Uh, 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 that, that's, that's very true what you just said. But what is the core interaction? If you think about healthcare delivery, I think that people mumbled it there uh, correctly. Yes. Just Doctor patient, right? So this is the core interaction between doctor and patient, right? That's kind of that's the core interaction when you think about healthcare delivery, right? There is a sick patient, there is a doctor or uh, some other clinician providing care. Uh, now around this, there is a lot of supporting infrastructure. I mean, for example, the hospital, the administrators, the other medical staff, and all of this basically consists of what we call a healthcare delivery system. Okay, so that's kind of a big system that is responsible to deliver care. Now around this. Uh, there are many other players, the, the government, the pharmaceutical and medical devices companies, the employers that people mention, and insurance, insurers and payers, okay? And um, this is how, you know, th these many blue arrows, this is how money flows in this industry. This is how money flows in this industry. So, any thoughts about that? It's complicated. Oh, that's one, one, one easy observation. It's a transaction between the two fundamental actors. Aha. So uh, could you elaborate on this? Yes. The doctor isn't being paid directly by the patient. Aha. Uh -huh. Isn't that strange, right? So if, if you think about education, right? Uh, you come to us here at Sloan, you get service, you get education, you pay, you pay, pay some money to the service provider, right? Uh, think about any other service. I mean, healthcare is to some extent a service. Uh, there is some money transaction between the customer and the service provider. Uh, in healthcare in the US, this doesn't exist. Or it exists, it's fair to say that it exists in very, very few cases. Uh, and, and that creates uh, a very, very stringent and, and uh, uh, misaligned uh, set of incentives. Okay? Um, coming back to the preventive uh, care issues. Currently, the main incentive is you being paid, if you are a doctor, you being, being paid by tr for treating sick patients. You are not being paid by keeping patients healthy. Nobody is going to pay you money for that. Okay? You, you are being, being paid to be reactive, to take care of sick patients, to do something. Okay? Uh, other, other, you know, just anecdotal kind of uh, examples that will give you a sense of how misaligned the system is. Um, so uh, think about an ear replacement. Um, so, uh, let's say that you do this just across the river in the uh, Mass General Hospital, okay? Or, alternatively, you go to uh, uh, Mount Auburn Hospital, okay? Same surgery, okay? Same, ex exactly the same. H how think the what, what do you think will be the cost difference? No? Same, same service. 60 percent, 70 percent. Okay. If you do an MRI in one of the private uh, uh, companies that give uh, give that versus MGH, it's going to be again 60 percent difference in in, co in 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 cost. That's the same MRI, right? Same machine. Okay. So um, by the way, uh, before you say, oh, oh, this MGH. These people, why do they charge so much? Uh, let me just give the counter example, the counter argument. Well, uh, if you want to have an MRI at MGH, you actually want MGH to provide you the service 24-7, right? You want to be able to get the MRI if you come in the middle of the night with a head, head trauma injury, okay? So uh, there are issues here. It's not, e so the, another fundamental challenge here is how do you really evaluate cost? And how do you evaluate cost not only for actually treating people but actually providing access. So again, the issues of cost, incentives, and quality are very fundamental and in the healthcare industry, it's fair to say there is no common agreement on what these should be. Or even if there is a common agreement, it's not clear how to align the system to actually uh, operate according to these incentives. Yes? And why do we care what the cost is because we need the patient? Absolutely right. So as a patient, uh, you don't have any responsibility to, to the cost. I paid my uh, insurance fees, and after that, all I care about is that you will provide me service. I, I have no responsibility, and if it costs X or 10X, that doesn't matter to me. Okay? So, uh, 
So this is a national challenge. I mean, this is not a sustainable uh, situation. And, and basically, if you think about how people think about approaching this national challenge, there are basically um, two fundamental approaches. One approach says uh, it's all about incentives. It's basically said, change the market landscape, change the incentives, all the other players will, will adapt and uh, uh, get to a new equilibria that is uh, uh, equilibrium that is uh, uh, much more efficient. Okay? Um, the fact of the matter is that this approach has not been successful uh, in changing the uh, healthcare industry. And one reason is um, that if you think about all of these models that sort of think about this from a kind of a game theory, incentives, uh, market uh, uh, structure, that this is how mostly economists uh, think about these problems and, and uh, policy makers, uh, they basically assume that the system moves from one equilibrium to another equilibrium. They kind of don't think about what happens in between, you know, how the system really is going to change. And moreover, uh, one thing that you need to remember, in this process when you move from one equilibrium to another, some players get out of the market, right, because they are not as efficient, uh, right? So now, um, when you think about healthcare, think about what will happen if MGH suddenly gets out of business. What, is matter, what does it mean to all of us? Okay? Um, it's not clear that you can afford yourself losing uh, fundamental players in, in this, in this uh, process. Um, so this is why the other approach of what I call the frontline approach uh, has emerged. And uh, I'm not trying to suggest that this is a necessarily an alternative approach to the first approach, but this is definitely something that should be complementing the first approach. Namely, just looking on market incentives and, and thinking that this is going to do the work for you is not going to probably uh, do the job for you. Uh, what you need to do is to really try and change the systems from the inside. Give them tools, give them management tools to actually become more efficient, become with higher quality, uh, and make the necessary changes to actually adapt to the new landscape that you hopefully can create. Uh, and we call it the frontline approach. And this has to do with a lot of stuff that is being uh, done here at Sloan, because it's, it's a very interdisciplinary management problem. Yes? Your first premise, though, that changing the incentives hasn't worked. Could be argued that the issue is the incentives haven't been changed enough. You basically talked about the doctor-patient relationship as being one of dealing with sick people. It's really a function of it's a fee for service, because I can go in and I can get a wellness check. That doesn't stop it. The issue here is, or one argument is, it's you're not paid for, and you said it earlier, you're not paid for providing quality. So you're not paid for maintaining patients being healthy or the largest population. Yeah, so, so uh, it, this is a fair comment. Uh, so maybe let me rephrase my point. Uh, the point I want to say is that if you just think about incentives at the very high level without understanding how these systems are going to go about and change and react to this, and you give the system the tools to actually change and the knowledge to change, you are not going to drive the change. Uh, because it's, it's not enough to come to an organization like MGH, 23,000 uh, uh, people work, I mean, it's the largest employer in Massachusetts uh, that is not government. Uh, it's not that you come to them and say, oh, wait a minute, you did business this way, tomorrow you're going to do a business another way, and you do like this, and they're just going to do it. Uh, and moreover, uh, you said many words there of quality. Uh, it's, it's nice to say that. It's a nice t saying. Question is, can we agree what quality is? And I'm sure that once we start to have a discussion what quality is, there will be many opinions, uh, at the very least. Uh, now, the point I want to make here is it's really a, 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 the two approaches come together that could drive this change uh, and, and, this, and address this national challenge. Um, now, let me tell you a little bit about Move to Sloan and tell you about uh, what has been happening uh, at Sloan in the last couple of years uh, regarding, uh, related to healthcare. Um, so at this point, uh, and, and I'm not sure I'm counting all of them, but at least I'm aware of uh, 22 fac over 22 faculty at Sloan that uh, are doing healthcare-related uh, research. Uh, if you think about Sloan currently has around 110 faculty, this is kind of... Uh, a sizable fraction of the faculty, uh, and this is, does not count what, is, uh, what exists across the other parts of MIT. Uh, so overall, I think it's fair to say that there is a critical, critical mass of a group of faculty 
that actually is do, are doing uh, research related to healthcare. Um, this research is actually um, characterized by collaboration with uh, some of the leading academic uh, uh, medical centers, uh, in particular in the Boston area, but not only in the Boston area, uh, MGH, Beth Israel, Brigham Women in Hospital Children's, and there are other fundamental players like the Kaiser Permanente that are all having a, a very ongoing collaborations with faculty here at Sloan. Um, healthcare has been injected more and more into the curriculum at Sloan. Uh, there, are, uh, there is an increasing number of courses and students today uh, have already a collection of courses that they can sort of uh, uh, go and, and take uh, and learn about this topic. Um, so, so this is the current state and, and I will hopefully in Today's, uh, the rest of the uh, lecture today, we will going to talk about more about some examples of the collaborations that are taking place currently uh, between uh, people at Sloan and uh, hospitals. But let me just talk about the future vision of this for a second. So the first question is, uh, so if you come to the dean and want to talk to him about this, so he's, uh, who, he will ask himself, why Sloan? Okay? Why do we need to do that? Um, so, so my answer, and I think that our dean uh, shares this answer, is it really fits our research and educational mission. Um, it makes an impact on the world. This is really a national challenge. Okay? Uh, it really requires an interdisciplinary management approach. Uh, and I think that there is no uh, better place than Sloan and MIT in general to integrate among different disciplines. Okay? So in, among these 22 faculty that I just mentioned, we really have people from all over the sp all the parts of the schools, all the three areas that we have. We have uh, econ economists, we have uh, operations uh, management people, we have marketing people, we have uh, strategy people, we have innovation people. They are all part of this uh, large group of faculty. So uh, that's really kind of another reason. And also, it's, it's fair to say that Massachusetts and uh, Boston in particular are pioneering in healthcare in many dimensions of healthcare. Uh, definitely the clinical aspect of this, uh, there is a lot of uh, state of the art uh, techniques that are being developed in this area. But uh, I don't know if you know, the healthcare reform in the US, the national healthcare reform, is primarily based almost a one to one copying of the healthcare reform that took place in Massachusetts in 2006. So Massachusetts, the state, actually is leading the curve. <laughs> Uh, leading the, the, you know, le as a leading co uh, state within the U.S. Uh, in terms of healthcare. Yes. But MIT has no medical school, so my question is: that a strength or a weakness for your vision? Uh, does it allow you to operate outside of? So if you ask me, if you ask me, if you ask me, it's actually an, an, an it's actually a, an advantage, and, and uh, let me explain you why. So, uh, so. So, so that's actually a very interesting question. So, so let me answer it in t from two angles. Uh, one of them is, um, the first thing is that we need to ask ourselves, what is the nature of the problem? Uh, I think that there is a tendency to see the uh, uh, challenge of healthcare as a, more an engineering uh, clinical challenge. Uh, I would argue that is essentially a management challenge. Uh, because it has to do with how you manage people m more than anything else, okay? All problems are management problems. Uh, well, no, so, so I think that, for example, to get to the, uh, from here to March, right, from, you know, to send some uh, spaceship to March is, you know, there, is a, there are management aspects to it, but if I think about what is the core kind of challenge, it's probably an engineering challenge, right, or a scientific challenge. It's, <laughs> it is a management po a problem, but... Uh, so um, I, I think that sort of if you look on problems, probably all of them are a blend of various aspects. But the question is, what is the core aspect of this? And I would, I would argue, I mean, it's debatable, that I think that the core problem here is actually manager, management problems rather than clinical or, or uh, engineering problems. Well, it's, it, 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 yes. The, the, other, the other thing, speaking about political, so think about a university that has a medical school. So you know that in every university, uh, when you know different parts of the school, there are some notion of zero-sum game, right? Because they all compete for the same resources. Okay. So to some extent, there is an advantage when you collaborate with people. Uh, and all of these uh, places here, these are actually uh, uh, hospitals that are affiliated with the Harvard system. Um, there is an advantage of coming with clean 
clean hands. So there, there is no, we don't compete on resources. It's really a win-win situation here. Uh, and the fact is that I think that they collaborate with us much more than they collaborate with the Harvard Business School. I actually, uh, I, I don't think, and in, in, in a second I will, I will get into details, I think that the kind of relationship that we created with them over the last five years, um, I don't know about too many similar uh, interactions uh, in, in any other university, even universities uh, that are equivalent to MIT in terms of their prestige, and universities that have uh, medical schools. So I think that the reality uh, actually showed me that this is definitely not a, a barrier, but I actually would argue that it's perhaps even a, an advantage. Okay, yes? I'd just like to give a small background of Dr. Nevis and Dr. Nevin Summers' question. He's, uh, both of us are actually faculty at the Harvard Medical School Club. Sure. For everybody and for you, I can tell you that these are teaser questions because he himself is an MIT person involved with teaching a course at the Harvard Medical School. Sure. He's part of HST. Yeah. So I think what he was trying to get at was that HST is a link between MIT and the Harvard Medical School. And that could be used as a vehicle. Sure. But yes. So, in fact, in, in one of the 22 uh, faculty that we have there, there are not all of them per se from school, but uh, 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 Richard Cohen, I think, is from HST, is actually part of our group. So, we are the fact that we are, I said, faculty at Sloan is we are very open to actually engage other, uh, other, uh, other people from. HST being debated whether it's even worth continuing that relationship anymore. Well, uh, I, I, since I'm not the dean or the provost, I would uh, <laughs> I'd be happily not to, uh, re, uh, uh, not express uh, not express an opinion about this. Okay. Uh, yes. Are there examples of actual outcomes that have been implemented as a result of some of these. That's the next part of the. That's the next part of the talk. That's like okay. So now, so far, nice words, Redsef. You know, okay, good for you. Uh, what are you trying to sell us here? Let's see if you can do something, right? So uh, fair enough. Yes. Just back to your points, uh, this future vision is, is, is grand, right? And when you are correct on the disciplinary part, is there an opportunity to, for Sloan to lead a strategic initiative at MIT to actually do all this? So that's exactly the next bullet. Oh, okay, good. That's exactly, thank you. I didn't pay here. That's not invited. I mean, I didn't pay. Sorry, it's the second thing, because you won't look this way again. Gee, people still complain about the attention here, okay. <laughs> Is, have you, have you I'm going to get closer, so okay, you will not complain. Okay. <laughs> the second thing is, have you looked at actually doing a small, like, a re real lab, a SimCity, of actually taking the small region and trying different models to see if it works? So that's exactly, what, that's exactly the vision of the next bullet. So okay. I think that the vision should be that around Sloan and MIT to form a center that will engage all academics with other players in the healthcare industry. And that includes hospitals, insurers, all the players, pharmaceutical uh, companies that start to think together about can we do it differently? Can we form a new science? And I, I really think that it takes a new science of how to deliver care. Uh, and that's the vision. And I will get back to this vision at the end of the talk again. Uh, because currently the only thing that stops us from uh, getting there is money. Uh, we already have the faculty. Uh, we already have the track record, as I hope to sh show you some of it. Uh, we already have the partners from outside MIT. We, we have the hospitals. They are all uh, aligned together. We have an agreement. We share the same vision. Uh, we just need now uh, the, the last enabler uh, money to try and, and, and it's, it's not going to guarantee the success, uh, right, because it's a very big challenge, but at least it will guarantee that we'll uh, try uh, to seriously address it. Okay? Yes? I want to make a comment. As a former medical school dean, Okay. I agree with your assessment that having the not having medical school is an advantage. Okay. Um, Tell this to the president. <laughs> well, when I left Sloan and assumed this position, I tried to put some management principles and economic principles in the curriculum of the medical school. And the faculty came to me and said, Bill, this is a medical school, not a business school. And <laughs> medical schools are really sporadic. Um, and it's hard for them to make change. And I think the ch management change has to occur so, so in lieu of America. Uh, ab absolute, absolutely true. And um, I think to, to make this change, uh, remember, I, I talked about the research, but there is an educational mission here. And, and I think that this place, one of the things to actually accomplish this would be to actually educate people in the, in the healthcare about the management disciplines that this place and other places, and MIT as a whole, is generating 
to drive and promote this change. Okay? So let me just get back to this. I, I, I was still challenged here. Could you show us that you can do something? Uh, so let me try and show you some things that we've done uh, in the last couple of years. Um, so let me just, this is a brief kind of introduction to one particular collaboration that we had, uh, that we have with uh, Mass General Hospital. Again, this is the, one of the largest uh, hospitals in the country, uh, one of the five top-ranked hospitals in, the, in this country, uh, basically um, the largest employer in the Massachusetts, 23,000 people. Um, it's th something that started two, five years ago uh, by two of my colleagues uh, here at Sloan, Ernie Berndt and Gabriel Vitran. Uh, I, I took over five years ago, uh, and I'm, I'm leading this uh, initiative and uh, collaboration. It has, has evolved, and I'm not going to go over all, all that is. I can just tell you that in the last two years, this is a project that is being funded at the level of the president of the hospital. They basically funded it at the level of $500,000, about $500,000 every year uh, to fund both postdoctoral fellows, uh, MBA students, uh, and moreover, they actually recently joined the leader of global operations group uh, a, a program, which is basically the former LFM program. So uh, just, this is just giving you a sense of the type of relationship that we currently have as two organizations. Uh, so far, our focus has been on the perioperative care system. This is the system that is responsible for doing surgeries within a hospital. Um, and uh, the, 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 the rationale is that this is, to some extent, the microcosm of the, of the entire hospital. Uh, it's fair to say that in, in the next year or two, I expect us to actually expand and actually address the uh, entire hospital. So uh, let, me, let me sort of uh, give you uh, a, a, a one minute background to the perioperative care system. Again, the system that is responsible to do uh, surgeries in, within the hospital. This is the, maybe the most important, from a financial perspective, this is maybe the most important system within the hospital because if you think about the revenue structure of a typical hospital, surgery is what brings the money. Uh, we can argue if this is the right setting, but the reality of the, the, the current reality is that this is the, this is the most uh, revenue generating activity of the hospital, is doing surgery. Uh, so I want to give you a sense of, of what this uh, system is about through already a management view that is developed, you know, it's very uh, common in this place, through a supply chain kind of uh, uh, view. Uh, so what is a supply chain? We take a f the flow of patients and information as well as the resources and processes to convert patients to operated patients. Okay? So at the core of this system that are the operating room. Okay? Uh, this is being fed by various sources, right? So there are the elective surger sur uh, surgeries that come through the surgeon's office through referrals. Uh, there are uh, the non-elective, the urgent uh, cases that come through the ED. Uh, they are all going to the ORs. And after the OR, uh, you can either go to the PACU, which is the recovery room. You can either go to an ICU. Uh, from there, you can either go to home or back to the floor. And you can see that things can flow here in various ways. Uh, it's complex. Uh, there are many, many resources involved in this. There are many processes involved in this. Um, and there is also the issue of how information flows and how the infrastructure uh, of IT uh, is playing a role. Uh, this is a very, very complex system. Just to give you a sense of the volume, uh, MGH currently has 52 operating rooms. On average, every day you do three or four surgeries per uh, room. That's kind of, think about the volume of uh, surgeries that you have per day in MGH. They're actually going to grow in a year or two to a new, and they're building a new building, they're going to grow in five or six years, they're going to go, grow to about 70 operating rooms. So that's kind of the magnitude of the challenge we are talking about here. Okay? It's a big, big supply chain. Okay? So today I'm going to talk about uh, two specific projects that we've done with them. One of them is already in implement implementation phase, so, so already things are happening. The other one is in very early implementation phases. Uh, so uh, the, the first one will have to do with, the, with, the, with something that does not show up here. But whenever you go to have a surgery, you need to be evaluated for anesthesia. So, so there is a clinic, there is a special clinic that you will be called upon to uh, be evaluated by anesthesiologists that y you are healthy and qualified to go through anesthesia through to, uh, during the surgery. Um, and so that would be one clinic that we are going to talk about. Uh, the, other, the other thing is we're going to talk about the impact of how you schedule surgeries on 
the hospital floors. How do you think about this systematically and how you make here, what you make here, how you schedule surgeries here, and how they affect about the bed sensors within the hospital. Now, if you look at this, there are many, many components in this system. I can tell you that in most hospitals, especially big hospitals, these components operate in a very kind of localized, uh, uncoordinated manner, okay, to, this, to the extent that uh, things that are being done in different places uh, in the system are not necessarily coordinated, and that leads to, uh, I always say, local optimization usually leads to uh, global disharmony. That's kind of a good example to this. Um, so let me go to the first example. Uh, this is the pre-admission uh, pre testing area. Again, this is the place where uh, if you have to go through surgery, you are being, you're going to be, it's an outpatient clinic. Uh, you're going to come there. You, you'll be, uh, have an appointment there. You will, you, you will be seen by an anesthesiologist, and they will try to clear you for surgery. Okay? Uh, that's their goal. And uh, this is a joint work with uh, a couple of MBAs and LGO students. Uh, Bevan Price is just graduating from the LGO program. Uh, I, 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 Andres Garo, again, and Leo Espendel, they are, they are all uh, graduating this year from the LGO program. Kelsey McCarthy is an MBA, Sloan MBA, that graduated a year ago and was hired by MGH. Uh, so this relationship, re relationship is already leading to hires of our students here at Sloan by healthcare organizations. And there is a big group at MGH that uh, actually worked on this as well. This was a collaborative work. Uh, that took place um, about uh, two years ago, started two years ago, and as I said, we are currently in advanced stages of implementation. So, so what is the mission? This is a state, how, how MGH states the mission of, of this clinic. So the mission of the clinic is to see 100% of, of the patients that are going to have surgery and clear them and document appropriately, clear them for surgery. Okay? Uh, so that's kind of the, uh, the business clinical statement of their mission. <clears throat> when we started to work with them, these were the challenges that they had. Uh, incomplete patient evaluations. Okay? Uh, there was a quality issue that caused a lot of delays in surgeries. Now, uh, j just a comment on the last thing on, the la on, the, on this bullet. So if you go, if you go to a, if you go to a, a hospital manager, and you ask them, how do they think about a clinic like PETA? Uh, they will think about it as a cost center. Okay? It's like, I have to do it. I don't get money for this. Uh, I just have to do it. Uh, that's a cost center. The fact is that this cost center actually has significant impacts on your revenue. Okay? So, but you need to look at it as a system. If you don't realize this, you're going to think about it as a cost center. The fact of the matter is that this is actually has a big impact on how you generate revenues because every moment of delays here in, in, the, in, the, in doing surgeries is, is translated to lost money, lost revenue, uh, extra cost for the hospital. Uh, moreover, although they aspire to see 100% of the patients, they currently only see 65% of the patients. The other 35% the other arrive on the day of surgery and being evaluated on the day of surgeries. Uh, surgery, and then if you suddenly see that they cannot do surgery, you have to cancel the surgery, okay, with all the, uh, the consequences that this has. Uh, and moreover, from a customer-patient experience, long wait times. How long? Patients could stay in the clinic for four hours, more than four hours. That's kind of the experience. And these are patients, I mean, that know that they have to go through surgery. It's not that exactly they come in, they say, move to uh, an alumni uh, weekend. It's not, uh, not exactly that. Uh, it, it's really uh, stressing. That's not the right uh, uh, service that you uh, wish to provide. Uh, now, they were actually in the process of putting a business plan of building a new clinic. They had the feeling that they don't have enough space and don't have enough resources. They asked for three more million dollars to actually implement this business plan. That was rejected by the management of the hospital. Uh, and this is where we started to work. So the basically, they were kind of hopeless, uh, uh, not knowing what to do, uh, and we're basically this, is where, this was the starting point. So um, this is the approach that it took. Uh, the first thing that you sort of, uh, that's kind of uh, interesting when you start to talk, work with hospitals. So uh, you come and say, okay, you have a problem with your wait times, okay? So what are your wait times? Um, <laughs> We don't know. We don't collect this data. So if, 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 if actually that's an interesting uh, fact about many hospitals, uh, 
They, they will collect data that has to do with the clinical condition of the, the, of the patient and things that are related to billing. They, a lot of the time, will not collect anything that has to do with operational improvement, operational performance, uh, or system design. So a lot of the time the data is not there. So the first step that we had to do is to collect data and we basically did a two week uh, data collection. Okay? Uh, then we analyzed the data uh, and used this to build a, a simulation uh, model of the clinic that allowed managers there to see what will happen if certain changes will take place. And this is really a crucial tool for uh, people in hospitals because most changes that you will think about in, uh, in hospitals are very expensive, very, very hard to implement. Back here, uh, try to convince doctors to do something differently than what uh, they used to. It's not an easy task. Uh, so you better be sure that what you're asking them is going to lead to better outcomes. Uh, and a lot of the time, it's hard to argue if you don't have a very good tool that will show you what will happen if you do certain things. Okay? So, this is the process. What you see here, this is the process of a visit in the clinic. Uh, so basically what you can see here, a patient comes in, uh, checks in, uh, the vitals are being taken, then uh, the patient will see both a nurse and an MD or an NP, nurse practitioner or a doctor, uh, in, in either order, so it could be both orders, uh, before there are some background uh, activities that they need to do in, in reviewing your uh, records and then summarizing the visit after they, they, they are done with the patient, then some blood work, and then going out. And you see all of these triangles are uh, opportunities for the pa patient to wait. So there's a lot of opportunities for the patients to wait in this process. Um, now, so that's kind of the process. Um, and the next thing I want to do is to share with you the data. Uh, what, what was the data that we collected suggested? So. So this is a typical average visit in PETA. Uh, the light blue is wait time, and it's broken there among all the various steps here. And the, the dark blue is uh, basically face time with the different providers. Any thoughts about how a patient will perceive such a visit? Badly. What, who said badly? You did. OK. Do you, do you mind uh, explaining us why do you think it's going to be bad? Well, there's obviously lots of errors that are causing um, between the handoffs that are, <coughs> are causing delays that have to go back and be revisited, and it's it's delaying the um, the patient from being released from the hospital and 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 being cared for. Okay. So again, the blue here is face time with providers. The 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 light blue here is sitting in a room alone, thinking to yourself, what's going on? Uh, what? 88 minutes versus 82 minutes. So more time you wait than actually you see providers. And moreover, that's the average. So the worst case could be much harder. So if you are, if you are mis uh, unfortunate and you ca uh, they invited you over lunch, around lunchtime, you're going to wait four hours. You're going to spend four hours in the clinic. Okay? So... Uh, Yes. <laughs> Those waiting times are nothing. <laughs> 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 we have like a two year model. So like but you sit there and wait with other Italians. That's fun, right? No, it's like. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is a trade off also between, like, you know, the cost. I mean, this costs a lot more. So, um, so let me tell you in a personal uh, story about me when I came to the US. Uh, so, in Israel, uh, when you come to the doctor, there is one wait room, and you wait there until the doctor sees you. There are no nurses, then, you know, you just, the doctor comes out, calls you in, and, and you see the doctor. Um, and sometimes you wait, right? So, um, uh, first time I come to the doctor uh, in the U.S., uh, after two minutes of being taken to a room by a nurse, she asks me questions, and I'm thinking, gee, this is a great country, right? I mean, see what the level of service they have here. I didn't wait even one minute. Forty-five minutes later, when I was alone in the room, I realized that the only thing that they did is just move me away to uh, wait alone in the room. Uh, so I'm not sure which system I prefer. Uh, but uh, yes? The other thing is you've got loads of wait time for the blood work and the vitals, which the resources to do these are cheap, and you can throw more of them in and really reduce okay. the customer waiting. So the only thing you should be waiting for is the MD. Okay. Not so much the other resources. Interesting observation. More observations? Yes. Well, 
information flow? Is it electronic or paper? And what kind of decision support do you have? Well, that's a good question. Um, so basically, everything is manual here on paper. It was, it was at least. Okay? And moreover, um, if you look on the questions that the nurse will ask you and the, the questions that the nurse practitioner will ask you, they are overlapping by more than 80%. So, you know, uh, the, first I see that. I said, don't you think it's kind of inefficient? Uh, say, no, we have to do it this way because the nurse has to fill in a reporting, a report to one system, and the nurse practitioner has to do it for another system, and these two systems do not talk to each other. And then I say, didn't you think about maybe scanning it to one database and then generate all the forms that you need? So the answer that I got from the uh, nurse there is that this is outside the scope of the project. And I'm just thinking, so it's like, why is it outside the scope of the project? Uh, so we, we had a disagreement on that. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, it, didn't, it wasn't outside the scope of the project. So uh, that was one of the things that uh, hopefully we're going to change here. Yes? So how long do you think it's going to take till we are able to check in at home, for example, and then we check in at home when you go to the If you are going to the, to the hospital, it will make complete share. So it's an excellent question. Um, I think it's a slightly more complex than uh, ch uh, checking in the airport because a lot of the time, uh, in order to actually process you, I need to get information from many people that not necessarily you have it. So, for example, let's say that you have a cardiac problem. Uh, I need to really get the cardiac report and, and the cardiac specialist to clear you. Uh, what what what? What is missing in this system is that basically the realization that the visit doesn't start when you show up, but actually start up when you actually we know that you are coming. That's kind of a, was a big, big mental change that they had uh, as, a, as a result of the work with us. And one of the recommendations is to put someone that will make sure that when you arrive, all the information is there. Because what happened a lot of the time, you arrive and suddenly say, wait a minute, you have a cardiac problem? Where is the cardiac report? Okay, no. We don't have it. Why don't you sit in the room and I'm going to st start making phone calls uh, to get this report, right? So um, many interesting, many details here. Let me show you another, another piece of information here. So these are the average utilization of the different resources in the clinic. That's kind of maybe to your, so this is, you know, we see this picture. This is kind of the wait times versus this picture. Any thoughts? Yes. You don't know what's needed in a surge situation, so I don't know if those are good numbers or bad numbers. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's exactly right. So uh, what does this say? This says that on average, the nurse is working 60, 63% of the time. The, the rest is she, she, the nurse is idle. Okay? So correctly, people say, OK, maybe there is some peaks and valleys here in the, in the, in the volume that requires this situation to be uh, the case. And this has to do with this picture. Right? Those of you, this is really taking you back to school. Uh, so if you think about a, a situation of a queue, okay, and you have the service provider or the machine, uh, there is a very interesting connection between how utilized the machine is and what is going to be the resulting average wait time. And this is being captured by the red curve here. Uh, and the red curve is, applies when you have variability in the system, namely that some things are not predictable. And Either the arrivals of the patients are not uh, predictable, the processing time of each patient is not predictable fully uh, in advance. Uh, however, it's fair to say that in most systems, if this will be the utilization, so again, this is, this is uh, plotting uh, utilization, what percentage of the time the, uh, how, what is the fraction of the time that the resource is actually working versus wait time, okay? It's fair to say that in most cases, when you have utilization levels of this level, you should not see too, many wait, too much wait time. These are fairly unutilized systems. Okay? Um, so that's kind of a puzzling fact, right? On one hand, the system is not highly utilized. On the other hand, the wait times are, are at the sky, right? So what, what is driving the issue here? Yes? One thing to consider is uh, different classes of patients. There are very difficult, frail, elderly, complicated patients, perhaps without good use of language. Um, and then there are other people, you know, who have broken their ankle and are orthopedic simple cases who can be streamlined much, much faster. Okay. So dividing the fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Other, other, other <coughs> thoughts here? 
Yes. One good thing it seems to be is you're maximizing the utility of the of the positions, right? So it's it's all people sure. in there. Sure. Sure. That's that's maybe a good thing. Yes. Fair enough. Other thoughts? Yes. Is there uh, an issue here with um, fear of making mistakes, fear of litigation, and whatnot? And that maybe slows the whole process down. So the fear of making mistakes is a lot of time a driver of, of slowing down things here. Uh, I'm not sure in, in this case is, is, is the case. So th coming back to the point here, so th the, the things that will drive something like this is uh, that there is a lot of variability in the system. Okay? So if you have a lot of variability in the system, this, this red curve will pick up much earlier. Okay? Now, let's just think about it just a second. Let's just think about it uh, in a, for a second. This is a clinic with scheduled arrivals, right? This is not a walk-in uh, clinic. So you really control when, hopefully, when patients uh, arrive. And also, uh, this is a pretty standardized process. I mean, fact is, to evaluate if you uh, can go through surgery is not such a complex process. I mean, it's a very well-defined process. Okay? So the question is, why do, we, why do we have these high wait times, although the system doesn't seem to be highly utilized? Okay. Now, think about them. If I come to the uh, manage, uh, leadership of the hospital and I want more resources, they're going to look on this and say, hey, w wait a minute, w what's going on, right? I mean, uh, it doesn't seem that you're actually using your res resource uh, to the maximum extent. Yes? MD is the only gating factor, the only gating factor. And 80%, to go back to your previous slide, 80% on the exponent, 80% is already very high up on the exponent. And you also get the piling up factor, the highway piling up factor. The moment you start falling behind, you, you, you get a much longer queue yeah. on, on anything. So, so, so the, interesting, the, the interesting fact was that even in the other, uh, play, the other steps, you had a lot of wait time. If, when we measure it. Yeah, because, you, you, because you, there's no reason for you to see a nurse if you can't see an MD. No, no, so, so, so just to like clarify, you could see a nurse regardless of whether you saw the MD. It was completely independent things, yet you waited both, to, in every step of the way, you waited a significant amount of time, even in the, for the resources that are very low, have very low utilization. So let's just see why this happened. Let me show you another picture. So this is, this is a picture, basically, think about each one of those, uh, each one of those is a different provider. Okay, where these are, uh, these are MDs, these are nurse, nurse practitioners, and these are residents. And what you see for each one of them, you see the statistics of how long it takes them to actually process a patient. Okay, so you, you see both the average, the, the mean, the median, the 25, 75 quantiles, and the, and, the, and, the, and the overall kind of span of how long it took them. Okay, so again, each one of them, this is a different provider. Okay? And what you see is statistics of how long it takes them on average, and, or, or the statistics if you, on over all patients that they saw over the, the 10 days that, or the 14 days that we collected data. Uh, Space in the hospital, because you want to keep people in different rooms, right? If everybody worked at their most efficient level, there'd be a crowd in one room. Uh, well, fit. M maybe so, uh, but, but I just, I, I, want to, I, I want to sort of uh, highlight what this is. This is, again, I, I looked on all the various providers in the clinic, and I, and I took at the statistics how long they, they take them to process patients. Okay? And these are, if you, you wonder whether they saw about the same patients, they did saw about the same patients. So it's not that one of them sees uh, the difficult patients and one of them sees the, you know, the easier patients. They all see about the same patients. So I look at this, and what, what comes into your mind? Did you interview these people to get this information, or did they? No, we just measured. We actually measured. We measured every time we measured when they started to see the patient, when they when they were over, and we really measured. And, and these are statistics. Some of them are reliably really fast. Some of them are fast. He decided no, 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 no surgery. Any thoughts about this? Yes. Is something happening in his activity that isn't pure medical delivery? The conversations that are happening better. Perhaps, okay. maybe for some other aspect that's Okay, so something is happening here. What, what other thoughts? What, what, what could explain this? Okay, so experience, experience. Uh, uh, so, so, okay, so what do we see here? We see, and, and this is a similar picture to different nurses. So what we see here that the seemingly the same task is being performed very differently by different providers. Right? Uh, now, what do you think will be the response of 
clinicians if you show them a picture like this. What? Reasons just one, one by one, one by one. Yes, what, yes. There's reasons you don't understand. Ah, yes, it's like, uh, you, you cannot tell us well how to do our job. This is like cli clinical. So here is my response to that. Uh, I'm not saying that this is the best guy. Okay, I'm not, I'm not saying that. In, you know what, I, actually this is the best guy because this is the head of the clinic, but okay. <laughs> but, but I'm not saying that. I, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, you know what guys, you decide how you want to do it, whether this is going to be here or here. Maybe, maybe this guy is not doing a good job. He's like rushing too much. And, and so, so you decide where you want to be. But after you decide where you want to be, you should be all about the same place, right? So these are unexplained sources of variability. We call this artificial variability that cause the system to actually underperform significantly and cause tremendous wait times in the system. Yes? I think you want them all to be the same. What you want is for all each of them to spend the minimum amount of time that they personally need to spend to make an accurate assessment. So, so let me just explain, let me just make it more precise what do I mean by the same. So one thing that you observed in this clinic, so how long you need to review the record of the patient before you see them? Some people did it in five minutes and some people took 45 minutes or 30 minutes. So my claim is cannot be that both of them are correct, right? I mean, either you need 30 minutes or you need five minutes. No, I think it can be. So okay. I'm a physician and I watched him over time. Medical school to residency. When he first arrived at the Trucial Medical Clinic, an underserved medical clinic in Fall River, Massachusetts, the head doctor of that clinic handles 4,300 patients. He can actually, because he has enough experience over so many years, he can look at a type 2 diabetes patient and he's treated, you know, however many thousands of them. It is taking much less time. And my husband, over the time that he was there, became much more efficient in the things that he's seen over and over and over again. Fair, fair enough. So your, your claim is that are, there always will be difference between different providers based on their, okay, but the difference here is not based on experience. It's based on what they're actually looking at, okay? There is no algorithm, there is no agreed algorithm that they say, in order to make a decision, these are the things that you need to look at. But some people legitimately, based on their experience, might be able to say, in my experience, I know that if it's this, 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 and this, in all likelihood, and you know, physicians are mostly based on making decisions based on likelihood, this is going to be fine. So my answer to you, my answer to you would be, if you have an experienced uh, uh, provider in the clinic that we believe and trust their uh, uh, experience, then we need to build an, uh, an algorithm that says, if you see this and this and this and that, everybody can now conclude that it's most likely that you, do you don't need, let's share, let's use the experienced people to actually teach the others how to do it. But there cannot be like 10 different ways that do not seem to have any different outcomes that one takes 45 minutes and one takes five minutes. I, I want to push the point. Everybody that's listening, and I, and I understand where you're going with it, but people learn in different ways. It's actually, it's actually excellent that you bring this. This is actually what you will hear from uh, doctors every time that you try to bring this topic. Uh, and I think that it's actually rooted in, the, in how, the healthcare, uh, how the medical profession has evolved. If you think about historically how the healthcare medical evolved, it evolved as an art. as something that is very individual, in, based on the individual skills uh, and is not, does not have any kind of uh, a, a, a group uh, knowledge group sharing knowledge between a group of people that decide together what is the right way to do things. Uh, fair enough. If people argue that this is the case, the fact the facts are, and there are many a lot of evidence that once you move to what I suggest here, that people develop a common algorithm, that they agree that there are many discussions and they adapt it over time based on the collective experience. Not only that the cost goes down, but also the quality goes up, right? Uh, and there are more than one example for this, uh, for this. So, and by the way, this should be led not by me. Deciding what the algorithm should not be decided by people at Sloan. They should be decided by people at the clinic because they know how to practice medicine. I'm not going to tell them, again, I'm not going to tell them where to be in this curve. I'm going to just tell them you need to agree what is the right thing to do to do it and just do it as a group. Yes? I think part of the problem is dealing with ambiguity. Okay. Uh, some clinicians deal with it well, others don't. 
And I think part of the problem is how thorough is thorough. Um, that if a patient comes in for a particular surgery, you should focus on the elements leading to that surgery, not all the extraneous things that may be there as well. Exactly. So, first of all, absolutely right that di different areas of medicine are more amenable or less amenable for something like this. So if you think about something that is very experimental, new, then definitely trying to come up with a unified way to do it is maybe not a smart thing to do. But here we are talking about very, very standardized process, well documented, a lot of literature, pe people, have, you know, people know how to evaluate it, and it's a fairly standardized thing. Uh, yet, you see a lot of variability. And uh, I think that actually, if you, if you talk with the people in the clinic, they will agree that this, is not, you know, that this is not the right way to do it. I mean, they will agree that you can build an algorithm that will actually be followed by everybody. Yes, I see that I, there is a lot of uh, reaction. There are a lot of reactions. What's really powerful here is that you're, you're seeing and understanding the system. I mean, you two can disagree on the, the, the way to use this data to solve the problem. But once you know that you know, Dr. A and Dr. B are doing things in very different ways, you can solve this queuing problem. You know, you, you, can, you can put them in different buckets. I mean, there's many different It's not only the Q problem, problem, by the way. It's also the quality issue because if, if, by the way, you need to collect data on this. But if you look and see, this actually, this person actually also has fewer mistakes than this guy. Then this guy must be, something, must be doing something suboptimal, right? Let's just teach and train that this guy. I'm not blaming. By the way, none of these guys is lazy. They're actually believing that they are doing the right thing for the patient. I don't blame, I don't think that there are too many doctors that are lazy or sloppy or most of them truly believe that they do the best thing for the patient. That's kind of the, the interesting part of this. Coming back to making an impact, and back to the experience, you cannot have discussions with doctors about this if you didn't gain their trust and you haven't been working with them for five years, right? These are the kind of discussions that you can have only if you develop long-term relationship with the organization and the people within the organization. And this is why I, b I believe that consulting, for example, consulting engagement will not solve problems like this because in order to be listened here, you need to be in the system and really know what they are doing for about four or five years before they start listening to you. I, I will take one or two more comments before I because I, I want to say a couple of more things. Yes? I'm just curious if you have interviewed patients a while after the visit and of their perception of quality of service. And if that had an impact, a further longer range impact on the cost of that business, not the immediate one in operations, but the longer term related to the quality of perceived service. Yeah, so, so I think it's fair to say that uh, by and large, they, they didn't make any major errors that caused the death or uh, injury to people in this case, okay? Um, Patients did complain about the wait times. They didn't have a good experience there. They, they actually appreciated the, the staff and, and the dedication of the staff. So it's, again, there was not a, it's not a case of lazy people here. It's a case of people that just don't do it, things in a more, most efficient way out of a belief that they're actually doing the right thing, right? And they don't even know what is wrong, right? They are frustrated. The clinicians there were actually as frustrated as the patients with the wait times, okay? So, so th there was a reflection of that in the patient feedback. And in fact, we, we did get f patient uh, feedback here. Last, last comment about this before I... I will make a shameless plug for my talk at 3 o'clock, which is about sharing tacit knowledge. Okay. And one of the opportunities we have here, which doesn't take five years, is to facilitate conversations among the physicians and to do it in a manner that's structured and that you're recording some of the variability and the opportunity. But it doesn't take five years, and it can use a consultant but it's better to be a consultant that's fully trusted. So, uh, there is an interesting talk at three. Uh, <laughs> so, so let me just make one comment about this. Uh, uh, so, when I talked about education, uh, in order to, for people to make these kind of uh, conversations and collect the data on a regular basis, you need to develop a, a, diff a certain culture of the organization that not necessarily exist in many of these organizations at this point. Uh, and I still would uh, somehow believe that in many of these organizations, to implement a cultural change of the kind that you're talking about uh, does not happen over uh, the course of a short period of time. It happens over a, over a longer period of time. But that's kind of my, 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 own, my own biased and, and very subjective experience about that. And I'm sure different people may have different opinions. Um, 
So this is a simulation model that we built. So this is with the real data, and this is how the simulation works out. And you can see that is a very good fit here uh, between what we simulated and the current state of the system in terms of the number of patients in the, in the hospital, in the clinic. Um, so uh, let's just talk about our recommendations. Our recommendations consisted of several uh, uh, domains. Uh, the first domain was get rid of paper, automate the process, and, and have the right kind of information flow. Okay. Second, uh, second thing uh, was to create accountability. So currently, if, I'm, if, I see, if I come to the patient and there is a downstream error later on, that's the, the, pa the clinic problem. But is there no specific individual that is accountable for the error? Okay. Uh, what we suggested to move to a team model, in which now you have a team of doctors and other clinicians that work together and are scheduled, getting scheduled patients to, to them. And now you see doctor, you are scheduled to see doctor X when you come to the patient, when you come to the clinic. Uh, then we move to uh, levels of training, basically uh, going back to the previous uh, slide that we saw these various providers that have different levels of performance, we said, okay, as a first goal, can we make all of them at the medium level? Take the slow ones and improve them by training to become medium level. And then maybe as a longer, uh, longer term uh, goal, can we actually make most of them very fast by standardizing the, the, the work? Uh, the work? Okay. And what you see here, for each one of these scenarios, we plotted uh, as a function of the number of p patients that will be seen every day. Currently, there are about f seven, 57 that on average that they, they see every day. Uh, what will be the resulting wait times? Okay. And so as you can see, the, these things are going down. So basically, uh, the overall uh, accomplishment that you can get here, uh, you can look at it from two, two, play, two, two ways. One of them, fix the number of patients that they see currently f uh, 57, so currently it's about 78, 80 minutes wait time. Uh, you can drive it down up to 12 minutes. Same level of resources. Same level of resources, no, no, no additional resources. O on the other hand, if you want to see more patients and still keep the wait time less than 45 minutes, basically you can push uh, up to 95. Namely, this is exactly the number that they aspire to see. That's kind of all the patients that they have. Again, with the same resources. Okay. Now, Currently, it's fair to say that they are about here. So they moved from here to here. Uh, they have a long way to go. But currently, you see suddenly an engagement from the staff within the clinic to actually make the change themselves. So we are currently not working with them anymore. They have this. They are on their own. We generated the process that sort of dr drove a change here, change of culture, change of an approach. And they basically work. And hopefully, they will get here. Uh, in a, in a relatively uh, reasonable amount of time. Uh, there are still leadership challenges there. Uh, I'm not going to go uh, and talk about this because I want to talk about the, another example very quickly. Uh, the, the one thing that uh, we also dr drove as a change is what I call the continuous improvement approach. Basically, now they installed an automated system that collects the data that we collected on a regular basis. So now we really have an, a an ability to do controlled experiments, right? You change something. And you can immediately follow how the change that you Im implemented uh, impacted the wait times, the processing times, the variability in the system, and so forth. Okay? So that's kind of uh, uh, one an additional uh, aspect of the recommendations that we uh, came, came about. OK, so let me uh, quickly talk about, I mean, I have about uh, 15, 17 minutes. So I, I want to talk about another example. Uh, so, so the last example was. Uh, really, process improvement, uh, an ex example where you take a clinic, close clinic, and you really, inside the clinic, uh, try to make a change. Uh, the, the next example is more about how you look at it as a system and how you take a system approach to actually uh, improve, the, improve the entire system. And again, this is joint work with a, 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 an LGO student and a postdoc here at MIT with the folks at MGH. Um, so. If you look on the flow of patients from the operating rooms through the recovery area, okay, and then to the floors, uh, you observe a couple of very interesting uh, phenomena. Uh, the first thing is that if you look on the occupancy level at, at the recovery area as the day goes by, 
by the hour of the day, you see this behavior. It starts to pick up at around 2 o'clock. It, reach it reaches a peak. Uh, then it starts to decay. Now, what happens here, that a lot of the time, you start to fill in completely the PACU, and now you are in the situation that you need to keep people that finish their surgery in the ORs. It's suboptimal qu quality of care. It's delaying all the surgeries that are coming after that. It's a big issue for hospitals. Now, if you look on the census of the, uh, throughout the days of the week, the census of the bed, the surgical beds in the hospital, they have a hump shape. So again, if you look on Sunday, it's very low. It picks up Monday, goes up on Tuesday, goes up on Wednesday. Wednesday and Thursday, it's, it's the peak. Then it goes down again. So again, in the middle of the week, and, and this is just the average picture, but there is variability around this. In the middle of the week, you hit your capacity. So suddenly, uh, you, you have uh, days where suddenly you have like 30 patients that don't have a bed. And now everybody stops everything. There are some emergency meetings, and they start to sort of uh, pull uh, patients from here to there. Now, on the other hand, there are other days in which you are actually not utilizing your capacity. Okay? So again, the question is, what creates this hump-shaped behavior? Uh, is it something, the, the force of nature? Is it something we can do something about this? And so forth. Uh, but again, uh, realize that the beds here are actually uh, the bottleneck that fills back the entire system. So it fills back the PACU because why the PACU is filled? Because you cannot release patients to the floor. Therefore, the OR is getting delays. And, and so, so it's really something that you need to think about it as a system rather than trying to optimize what is happening in the PACU trying to optimize what is happening in the ORs and trying to optimize what is happening in the floors separately. You really want to think about the end-to-end -end system here rather than in each one of the components separately. So here is analysis that we've done here. So what you see here, this is the surgical uh, the census, bed census in the hospital, uh, where each one of the patients is basically uh, char characterized uh, or into several categories. Uh, the, 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 the dark gray here is basically non-surgical patients. These are patients from other parts of the hospital that capture uh, sur surgical beds. Uh, these and these are non-elective non sur surgeries that come in an unplanned manner into the hospital. You don't control them. And these guys, these are basically the elective su surgeries, the elective uh, patients. Now, you look at this. So what do you think causes this hump shape? Which, what types of patients cause the hump shape, if you look in this picture? The what? Scheduled. The scheduled cases, right? So all the others are very, very flat. What actually creates this uh, hump shape is the elective surgeries. Are the elective surgeries. So again, an example of artificial variability. These are a variability that is not part of the nature around us or the environment around us is part of how we do business. Okay. Now, can we do something about this? Uh, uh, perhaps yes. Okay. Well, I, I'm not asking if, I, if the answer is no. So apparently we, we were able to do something about that. So, uh, so let's see what we did. So with further analysis, what we realized that this hump shape is really controlled by patients that have post-surgery length of stay in the hospital of less than a week. So this is the current schedule and the resulting, uh, this is the output of the current schedule, the current way they schedule surgeries, and how these patients, the census of these patients only, behave in the, uh, 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 across the days of the week. Now, uh, one word of how, uh, on how uh, surgeries are being scheduled, uh, elective surgeries are being scheduled in an in academic hospital. Basically, each surgeon gets a block of time. So I say, Surgeon uh, uh, Retzef, if I'm a surgeon, you get Monday, 7 to 5, this operating room, and now it's your job to schedule into that block of time. Okay? That's kind of how they do that. So what we said, can we take this as a given? And there are very good reasons why you, should, you want to have something like this in an academic hospital, because all of these clinicians have, like faculty at Sloan, they have other commitments. They, are, they teach, uh, they have clinic days. It's not that they can come every day to do surgeries. Surgeries needs to be concentrated uh, it ha you have to concentrate this on, on certain days. That said, can we take all of these blocks and shift them around? So we build an optimization model, and this is a technique for those of you that took DMD. 
Uh, I don't know if you remember, the, you took once a course like this, uh, that you talked about a, a technique that is called integer programming. Uh, we basically build a, a model that reshuffles the blocks under all the constraints, because I, I cannot let's take a cardiac, cardiac room and shift it to endoscopy room, right? They don't have the same equipment necessarily. So I really have a lot of constraints here that I need to respect. But w we did that, and we were able to s generate a, a different schedule of blocks that leads to a very different, much smoother census of beds, bed census. So if you see here, the peak here is 80. The peak here is 70. And this is on real data. This is not simulation, by the way. This is like we, we said, OK, let's say that you would apply the new block scheduling that we recommend on past data. OK? That would be the resulting census that you will get, which is much smoother and is going to be much more convenient to handle. OK? So again, uh, this is something that's very easy. OK, you write, the, 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 you write everything, you get it. Now go convince surgeons to actually shift their blocks. Okay. What is the power of this, though? Now you can see the impact, right? You have a picture that really shows, OK, this is going to be the difference. Uh, so you have much more leverage in the discussions with the with surgeons. And I can tell you that in the last uh, two months, I'm, I personally participated with uh, many meetings with the chief of surgeries of the different services at MGH, where we presented this to them. And so far, we get buy-in. Uh, yes, they have comments, and we need to, it's an iterative process. But, but, but they realize, when they see this picture, that they have something to win here. Because in this system, if I want to grow the volume of surgeries, I can do it much, easily, much more easily here than in here. Here, I basically hit my capacity. Uh, the, the system is bottlenecked. Here, because you smooth things, you now have extra capacity. So there is a win-win situation here to all the stakeholders. So, so that was the elective surgeries. And what you see here is, in fact, the fraction of the days, this is just a Wednesday, the fraction of the days when you have high census is going dramatically down under the permuted schedule that we suggest. So it's not only on average look, looks better. On the ver every day, if you look on the number of days when you will hit your capacity, this, no this, this, this number goes down significantly when you hit the high, the high, the high census levels. Okay? So we really help to prevent many, many days of hectic, uh, many hectic days in the hospitals, where, again, when you are here, basically everybody stops everything they do, and they start to take care of the crisis. And hospitals, they are very good in taking care of emergencies. That's kind of their expertise. Uh, but sometimes planning uh, in advance is, is better than just handling emergencies. Um, so last thing that I want to say here, uh, so these are elective surgeries, but there, there are also non-elective surgeries. These are surgeries that come through the, or, the ED. You come, and then I need to see you uh, in an unscheduled manner. I need to operate you. Uh, and if you think about uh, non-elective uh, surgeries, uh, you classify them into non-urgent that you need to see within 24 hours, urgent that you need to see within four hours, and emergencies that you really need to see immediately. 45 minutes, you come with your head trauma. I really need to put you into the surgery very, very now, basically, right? Uh, that said, what you see here is a statistic that 30% of the patients, okay, actually that come, in, uh, uh, come and, and, and they call it the waitlist cases, these, these are cases that come in an unscheduled way, uh, are not being seen according to the d desired, desired uh, within the desired uh, time window, okay? So there is an access problem here. The question is, what is the impact of this? So let's see what is the impact of this. Here is one fact. On average, 12 beds in the hospitals are occupied by non-urgent patients that were not able to see in within 24 hours and had to stay overnight at the, in the hospital. So think about this. You have overall 900 beds. The overall utilization is 95, 96%. 12 beds are actually wasted. It's just waste. They just wait in the hospital for surgery just because you were not able to see them on time. You now, you, you, you're now not going to be paid for this uh, 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 hospital uh, day. Because usually, the way you pay for surgery is the hospital gets a lump sum of money for doing the surgery. It doesn't matter how long the patient stayed in the hospital. So this is like 12 net be beds every day, on average, that the hospital can save. Okay? Let's just look on urgent patients. What you see here is a statistic on 
the post-surgery length of stay of urgent patients that were seen on time versus the ones that were not seen on time. Again, the time window here is four hours. What you see here, that there is a huge difference in the post-surgery length of stay. Two, more than two days extra you stay in the hospital if, you, if I wasn't able to see you on time. So that's kind of a in, very interesting spiral effect where basically uh, on one hand I don't ha give you access but not only that I don't give you access I actually hurt my throughput because now you're going to stay more in the hospital. And when MGA saw these this things they, they were like wow. Uh, not to mention the quality issue that there, are, there is here, because usually length of stay is, a, is an indicator for uh, the, the condition of the patient, right? Uh, how to solve this? Uh, we came up with the concept of open blocks. What are open blocks? This is like using a very uh, fundamental idea of pooling resources, basically taking a block of times that you keep ready for these non-elective surgeries with all the necessary staff to take care of these patients as they come in a timely manner. And what we were able to show that with a relatively few such blocks, you can actually reduce the number of surgeries that you will not see on t in time to 1 or 2 percent. With all the bed savings that I mentioned before, you can basically eliminate that. And this is, again, something that generated a lot of excitement at MGH and is under, they already wrote the new proce procedures of how to use these open blocks. They already identified the times in which they're going to institute these blocks. Uh, and this is actually something that uh, change the way they did business. Okay, so let me just conclude. Um, uh, beyond the various examples, I just want to say, I believe that Sloan has the critical mass and the right position to take the leadership, uh, leadership role in transforming healthcare management in the U.S. Uh, I am a strong believer in that. I'm very passionate about that, as you could see. I think that the center at MIT that will engage academics with industry players uh, to start and create what I believe is a new science to how to deliver care in this country, and maybe more generally in the world, uh, is not only a national challenge, but a, a, something that we should take upon ourselves. Uh, and I think it, it, it's the only, th this kind of collaborations is the only way to address this challenge, because it really takes an interdisciplinary approach to even start thinking about these things. There is always a, already a very positive feedback to the classrooms. There are already cases that are developed based on this uh, research. Uh, there are many courses that are being offered, so Sloan students are already benefiting from this research work. So there is a very interesting integration here between research and, in, and education. Okay? Uh, and I think that the last component, I think we touched about this, I think we ought to develop an exec ed component of this because one enabler to drive this change is to teach people within the healthcare industry how to think about those problems in a more scientific manner, applying management uh, concepts that we at Sloan uh, our leaders in developing and that we applied very successfully in other industries. I hope that uh, you were not uh, getting bored uh, this morning and I wish you uh, a great uh, rest of the uh, experience here at Sloan uh, uh, this weekend. Thanks.